Hello, welcome to Scott's Odyssey. Today we are visiting a rather solemn site, a location where at least 57 Irish immigrant workers were diligently milling a swath through a ridge to help better align the needs of the Philadelphia Columbia Railroad. A place lost to myth, local legends and ghost stories, a horror story that would not become a historical fact until over 170 years later. Welcome to Duffy's Cut. See you in a minute. Welcome back. If you've watched my videos before, thank you for your patronage. And if you're new to Scott's Odyssey, welcome aboard. In 1832, the Philadelphia Columbia Line of the Railroad, later to become part of the Pennsylvania Railroad, was in the process of being built. Now, one of the important things to remember is that at this time, the Irish were probably the most hated and discriminated against people to come to America. You heard that right. Not Europeans, not Africans, not Asians, nor even the American slaves, but rather the Irish. They were considered to be a subhuman species of people and were treated as such everywhere they went. Their religion was predominantly Catholic, which at that time in the United States was another reason to just spread hate in their direction, because I guess that's what is taught by non-Catholic Christian religions at that time. To make things worse, and this may be one of the strangest things you have ever heard, but it's an absolute fact. The Irish were not considered to be white people. <laughs> yes, you heard that correctly. The Irish were not white. They were so pale and transparent in skin color to be considered more genetically similar to black people with lesser evolved skin tones. Coming out of Ireland in the 1830s, even before the Great Potato, Potato Famine, also meant that these Irish were nothing more than slaves to the royalty that owned the land they had left behind. So. Of course, they were no different as people than the black slaves of the South, property that essentially escaped their masters. And then there was the whole scientific proof that the Irish were unintelligent and lazy, proven, of course, by the phrenologist who measured their facial angles and the knots on their head. Hashtag historical fact. That is why they were considered the greatest laborers you could possibly hire. They worked for nearly nothing and nobody gave any concern for their well-being along the railroads, the mines, or the canals that they happened to be carving through our country to make it what it is today. But we'll get into more of the hate toward the Irish in a future video. Right now, let's focus on Duffy and his crew. Philip Duffy was a contractor milling his way through the Malvern, Pennsylvania area and often employed immigrant Irish unskilled laborers that he would pick up at the docks when they came into port at Philadelphia. Now, 1832 was an important time period on the history of disease. You see, at this time, the world was going through the second Asiatic pandemic, and all these immigrants coming to America would often bring or fall victim to this disease. This particular pandemic was cholera. Cholera is a bacterial infection that affects the small intestines, causing severe diarrhea and dehydration. It is fatal if left untreated and is usually spread through water. Unlike many other diseases of this time period, cholera still exists in China and has been also found in Haiti. The ship named the John Stamp left port from Derry, Ireland on April 24th, 1832 and was headed to first Philadelphia and then New York. Its complement of passengers included 57 men and women from Tyrone, Derry, and Donegal of Ulster that would be disembarking at Philadelphia. Now, it was not as easy as you'd think to get to Philadelphia and just walk off the ship. There was a pandemic. Quarantine processes re were required before you went into Philadelphia. None of these 57 people had the disease because the ship pulled into the Lazaretto in Tinicum, where they were quarantined until proven not infected. Lazaretto, or Lazarette, was a quarantining and isolation station of all maritime travelers during this time period used to stop the spread of disease into the United States. As a matter of fact, 
anyone from overseas seeking to come into the Port of Philadelphia or anywhere north along the Delaware River were all isolated at Lazaretto in Tinicum, where, if you remember from the Fort Mudd video, is the southernmost point of the island that now houses the Philadelphia International Airport, but was, at this time, the largest seaport in the world. So these 57 immigrants received a clean bill of health from the doctors at Lazaretto, and that's when Philip Duffy steps in. He now has at least 57 willing and able immigrants who were just happy to have a paying job the moment they stepped onto the mainland of Pennsylvania. Their job? Well, they were going to set up camp at what is now Malvern, Pennsylvania, perform milling work on the Philadelphia Columbia Railroad. Essentially, they were to remove all the trees and large hills from one end of the line to the other by cutting down the trees and cutting a swath for any hill that may cause an issue for a nice flat level railroad. So directly next to the rails was an Irish camp, which was atypical of the time period. If it was short work, it would be a camp. If it was long work, it would become a shanty. And if it required more than two years, it would become an official company town. And then it happened. Someone either had brought in cholera or the water system being used was carrying contamination. But either way, a cholera outbreak took place at the Irish camp. Now, typically during this time and recorded in medical journals all around the world, cholera had a 40 to 60% survival rate. That means that this disease killed approximately 40 to 60% of those who were infected. Unfortunately, according to what local historians tell us, only this particular cholera outbreak at only this particular Irish camp, 100% of all the Irish immigrants died. That means that all of the Irish immigrants and nobody else contracted the cholera and all of the Irish immigrants and nobody else perished. And that story is repeated to this day and was believed for over 170 years by everybody. That was until something was accidentally discovered in an old dusty file that kicked off an investigation that is still ongoing. The first odd event was the building of a fence by Patrick Doyle in 1870, who was a PRR construction worker, expanding the width of the railroad further west. He came across two human skulls and other bones, which he had moved away from the railroad and then built a wooden fence around where they were buried. In 1909, Martin Withington Clement, the assistant supervisor of the PRR Paoli line, while expanding the area even more, had a stone monument built using the sleepers or sills to replace the wooden fence. So sat this monument, and with allegedly no foreknowledge to who was buried there, ensuring that the 170-year-old secret at Duffy's Cut would remain buried. Now, there was a lot of local lore and myth going around that there were way more bodies buried down by the railroad, the actual myth of the Duffy's Cut Massacre. The story goes that when the Irish arrived, they were scathed at because they were impeding proper people from doing proper jobs and even putting proper white men out of business. In particular, some prominent local family farmers formed a group called the East Whiteland Horse Company, who owned where this railroad and Irish camp were located back in 1832 and were also known to be vigilantes who would track down horse thieves and other breakers of the law, as well as they were haters of the Irish. In steps fear and mass psychosis of the people, very much like what we see with the current events in the world today, surrounding false information about a disease, how it spreads, how some people transmit it and others don't, not to mention ways in stopping it from spreading and the local jabber from those who know nothing and the media spreading whatever they needed in order to make a buck. Well, the story goes that the Irish were all massacred due to this panic, that they would somehow spread the disease to the white people. The local blacksmith of the PRR, Malachi Harris, along with four Catholic nuns from Sisters of Charity, allegedly did their best to aid the sickly at this time. The story continues that many of the Irish who were not sick tried to leave the encampment and were hunted down and slaughtered by the men of the East Whiteland Horse Company. Other stories speak of ghosts walking along the railroads being seen regularly throughout the late 1800s. 
When the railroad changed hands from Philadelphia Columbia Railroad to Pennsylvania Railroad, there was a file of all things that had transpired. One person who had performed a full investigation into some of the records was none other than Martin Clement, the PRR Paoli Assistant Super, whose investigation of records and direct interviews told a much darker story of what actually had transpired in this location, as well as what may have touched him to the point of building this stone monument to mark the location. So the PRR fully knew of what had happened in this location and kept it quiet as a little secret. Even after the PRR shut down in 1964 and all of their files and information were auctioned off in 1970, the story and file of Duffy's Cut was kept secret. The PRR was well aware that there were many more bodies in this valley. That's because Martin Clement's personal assistant, Joseph F. Tripishin, had pulled this file and taken it home. Now, the reason for this action is unknown. Maybe he was protecting Martin. Maybe he was protecting himself or the PRR, or maybe he intended on publishing this information at a later point. It doesn't seem likely that the later is why he did this and that the former is more likely for his reasons, but either way, it's unknown. Fortunately, two of his grandchildren decided that the story not only needs to be told, but needed to be deeply investigated. Here is how the 170-year-old story of Duffy's Cut is currently unfolding. During the initial dig at the site, it was found that there were a good number of bodies at this location. Each body seems to have been found in a coffin. Now, the first odd thing was that they were in coffins, not to be confused with a casket. A casket is a rectangle, while a coffin is a hexagon in shape, and caskets were the standard shape shortly after 1848. The next oddity is that each coffin had over a hundred nails to seal them, which during that time was rather ridiculous being that it only took about 20 of the two inch long nails to more than sufficiently seal a coffin very tightly. So the only reason why you would use so many nails on a coffin is to make sure that nobody could possibly open it back up to see who or what was inside, like possibly people who did not die of sickness and were instead bound and murdered, which is unfortunately what has now come to pass as what happened. I know, sounds like a conspiracy, right? Well, if these people whom were found here had died of the popular disease during that time, then they would have just burned the bodies and mass grave what was left. Another interesting fact during the investigation is the answer to the question of where did all these coffins come from in such a small remote location? I mean, it's not like people were dying in mass numbers such that undertakers and coffin makers were turning out coffins on overnight assembly lines. Well, as it would turn out, the East Whiteland Horse Company may have had a good number of them on hand. We do know that they had at least seven coffins already prepared before they even hunted down the seven Irish immigrants that tried to leave the Irish camp. While the archaeologist dig continues, the grandchildren of Tripperchand, who kept the file on this location, Frank and William Watson, spearheaded the uncovering of the story for what really happened at Duffy's Cut. At this point, everything points to a complete conspiracy and most definitely a massacre of Irish immigrants who were just trying to make ends meet in the new world. Stories like this one are much more common than you may realize. And as I have explained earlier, show us just exactly who we once were and, well, really still are in more ways than we realize. Since the beginning of this dig at this site, some interesting things have transpired. On March 9th of 2012, the sister cemetery to the local Laurel Hill Cemetery, West Laurel Hill, held a memorial and burial service for five exhumed individuals from Duffy's Cut. Four of them were men and one was a woman. The woman most likely being the 29-year-old widow, Catherine Burns, who left Derry on the John Stamp in 1832, only to become one of the seven victims of the East Whiteland Horse Company hunt for escaping. On May 19th of 2018, Laurel Hill Cemetery donated and installed a grave marker to a particular interment site located at St. Anne Catholic Parish Cemetery in the Port Richmond neighborhood of Philadelphia, which at the time would have been known as Old Richmond, the stone was placed on the burial site of none other than Philip Duffy. Yep, that's right, 
Philip Duffy was buried when he died back in 1871 and until 147 years later in 2018 remained in an unmarked grave. You see, his family decided that it would be best to leave his grave unmarked for fear of desecration, which suggests that pretty much everyone knew something horribly wrong happened here in Duffy's cut and that he too was attached to what had happened either directly through action or indirectly through silence. Because of his own Catholic Irish blood, I would assume it was more than likely an indirect participation through silence, most likely due to the fear of ending up just like all the rest that he had recruited, hired, and managed over. Duffy's Cut, a 170-year-old legend and myth coming to light as something that should be renamed as Duffy's Cut Massacre, where at least 57 Irish immigrants came to the New World to remove themselves from a tyrannical life, only to be treated as dirt and all end up dead within two months of setting foot in the free world. A hallowed location that kept secrets of who we once were, but is only believable because you can easily see people seeking to do the same exact story again today. I hoped you liked this story and the revelation of what it sometimes takes to release the truth of our history. As always, I thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.